Lesson 2.1 is functions. A function is a relation that assigns every value in the domain to a single value in the range. Every x only has one y. A lot of times this relation is represented with an equation, but not always. Um, and the single value y that we talk about is the x's image. That's a vocab word you'll hear. A tool that we have to test to see if something is a function is the vertical line test. So if you have a graph of a relation and you draw a vertical line anywhere on the graph, if it intersects the graph more than once, it is not a function. This x coordinate would have two different y coordinates. So if it only ever intersects in one spot anywhere on the graph, then it is a function. The independent variable, which is sometimes called the argument, is the variable that represents all the values in the domain. Often we use x, but it doesn't have to be. Function notation is written as y equals f of x, so we call this f of x, it's not f times x, and it means the value of f at any number x. And again, you can use any variables, it doesn't have to be f and x and y. So if we have the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x, we have a bunch of different things that we want to evaluate. For this first one, we have f of negative 3. So anytime you have something inside the parentheses, it means we want to replace every x in the original function with that value, or that variable, whatever it is, and simplify it as far as you can. So every time I saw an x in the original function, I replaced it with negative 3. Parentheses are your best friend. Whenever you're substituting something inside something else, make sure you always use parentheses, especially if there's a fraction or a negative. So I end up with 2 times the quantity negative 3 squared minus 3 times negative 3. Negative 3 quantity squared is 9. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9, so you end up with 2 times 9 plus 9 or 18 plus 9, or 27. So the value of f of x at negative 3 is 27. Whenever you have something outside of function notation, that means it's going to be applied to the entire function. So I'm going to multiply f of x by a negative 1. So I'm going to have a negative 1 times the whole function 2x squared minus 3x, so I use parentheses to represent that, and then I distributed the negative in, I ended up with negative 2x squared plus 3x. So again, it doesn't matter even if you have variables inside, if you have entire expressions inside, if it's something's inside the function notation, you're going to replace x in the original function with that whole thing. If you have something outside, you're going to apply it to the entire function. You can also like add and subtract together. f of x just means the very original function. So go ahead and pause the video and try the last three, f of x minus f of 3, f of x plus 3, and f of a negative x. So for f of x minus f of 3, f of x just means take the very original function, so it's just the 2x, minus, 2x squared minus 3x. For f of 3, I'm going to replace every x in the original function with a 3, so I have 2 times 3 quantity squared minus 3 times 3. And then I simplified that and I got 9 and I just subtracted, so then I ended up with 2x squared minus 3x minus 9. For f of x plus 3, I replaced every x in the original function with an x plus 3, and then I simplified. So x plus 3 quantity squared is x squared plus 6x plus 9, and then if I multiply that by 2, I get 2x squared plus 12x plus 18. If I distribute the negative 3 into the x plus 3, I get negative 3x minus 9. So if I simplify this, I end up with 12, 2x squared plus 9x plus 9. And then for the last one, I'm going to replace every x in the original function with a negative x. So I end up with 2 times the quantity negative x squared minus 3 times negative x. Negative x quantity squared is just positive x squared. Negative 3 times negative x is positive 3x. So anytime you have something inside the function notation, you replace every x in the original function with that. Anything that, anytime you have something on the outside, it applies to the entire function. This is called the difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. It's a form of slope. You're subtracting something and then dividing it by a change in the x, essentially. Um, and it's going to become a very important piece of calculus. It's a fundamental piece of calculus that you're going to talk about. Um, for now, we're just going to talk about how to manipulate this algebraically with our function notation, very similar to the previous slide. We're going to look at that same function, f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x. And this first part says f of x plus h. So every time I see an x in the original function, I'm going to replace it with the entire thing x plus h. And then after I do that, I'm going to subtract off the original function. And after all of that, I'm going to divide by h. For the first part, I replaced every x in the original function with an x plus h. So I have 2 times the quantity x plus h squared minus 3 times the quantity x plus h. And then I'm just going to subtract off the original function. Parentheses are your best friend. Put parentheses around the first part, put parentheses around the second part, put parentheses when you substitute in. And then everything's divided by h. This is the most common mistake. This very first step, not replacing every x in the original function with an x plus h, but rather just trying to add an h on the end. 
make sure you replace every x in the original function with an x plus h. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just simplify this algebraically. The first thing I did is I just fold out the x plus h quantity squared and got x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. This is another common mistake is not to fold this out but to just distribute the squared. Make sure you fold out completely. Then I distributed in the 2, the negative 3, and the negative 1 and got 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3x minus 3h and then negative 2x squared plus 3x. And then all of that is still over h. So now what you should notice is that some things cancel. And the key piece is if you've done everything correctly at this step, everything without an h in the numerator should cancel out. So we have a positive 2x squared and we have a negative 2x squared. We have a negative 3x and we have a positive 3x. So everything that didn't have an h in it canceled out. The reason that's so important is because we eventually are going to want to cancel this h out of the denominator. Because in calculus, we're going to make the h be 0, and you can't have a 0 in the denominator. So if something without an h is not canceling, you did something wrong. Okay? Everything without an h should cancel. So now, everything in my numerator has an h, so I'm going to factor that h out. So when I factor out that h, I end up with h times the quantity 4x plus 2h minus 3. And so now I have an h divided by an h. Anything divided by itself is 1, and so those cancel. So now what I'm left with is 4x plus 2h minus 3, and that's going to be my final answer. You will have h's in your final answer. You just won't have h's in the denominator by themselves because, again, in calculus, you're going to make h be 0, so you have to be able to plug that in. So again, key pieces, the most common mistake is the very, very first step. Make sure you're replacing every x in the original function with an x plus h, and then make sure you're subtracting the original function back off. Then algebra, fold everything out, distribute everything completely. If you've done everything correctly, everything without an h should cancel out of the numerator. So then you can factor that h out, it cancels with the denominator, and you're left with your final answer. So now we have a word problem because the whole point of math is to use math. So this function n of r equals negative 1.35 r squared plus 15.45 r minus 20.71. And it represents the number n of housing units in millions in 2012 that had r rooms, where r is an integer because you can't have half of a room, and r is between 2 and 9 included. So a lot of information that they're giving us here Basically, it's representing housing units in terms of rooms, and we want to find some information for it. So the first thing we want to do is identify what the independent and dependent variables are and what they represent. And then we want to evaluate n of 3, just like we've been doing, and provide a verbal explanation of what that means. So go ahead and pause the video and try this. Your independent variable is always what the other variable is depending on, so usually your x or whatever variable they're using that is similar to x. So in this case, it's our r, which represents the number of rooms. And then our dependent variable is the one that's being affected by our independent variable. In this case, it's n, which is the number of housing units in millions. So then to evaluate n of r, I'm just going to plug in 3 every time I see an r in the original function, and I end up with 13.49 million housing units which means that there are 13.49 million housing units that have three rooms in 2012. The next thing we're going to talk about is the domain of a function. The domain is the set of all possible input values x. The most important piece is that context trumps everything. So if there is a context to your problem, that might limit your domain more than just the function itself. Right now, we're going to start with just two domain rules. The first one is if you have a rational function, so a function that looks like a fraction, we can't divide by zero. So for rational functions, whatever is in the denominator cannot equal zero. So you would set your denominator not equal to zero and solve that. And whatever x or your independent variable is, it can't be that. The next is square root functions. We can't take the square root of negative numbers in the real plane. So whatever is inside the square root must be greater than or equal to zero. So you take whatever is inside the square root and set it greater than or equal to zero. Polynomials, linear functions, quadratic functions, higher order polynomials, they're always all real numbers. So go ahead and pause the video and try to find the domain of these four functions. The first one is a polynomial, it's a quadratic. All quadratics that do not have a context to them, the domain is all real numbers. So all real numbers, negative infinity to negative infinity. This is the bold face r, it represents the set of real numbers, so a lot of times we'll use that to represent all real numbers.
The next one, h of t equals the square root of four minus three t is a square root function. So whatever is inside the square root must be greater than or equal to zero. So subtract four from both sides, divide both sides by a negative three. Whenever you divide by a negative, you have to flip your inequality symbol. So you end up with t is less than or equal to four thirds. The next one, you end up with a rational function, three x over x squared minus four. So we can't divide by zero. So whatever is in the denominator cannot equal zero. So x squared minus four cannot equal zero. I added four to both sides and then took the square root. Whenever you take the square root, you have to remember plus or minus. So x cannot be plus or minus two. It can be any other real number. It just can't be positive or negative two. And then the last one, d of x, is both a rational function and a square root function. So you actually have to take both of those into account. So I dealt with the rational function first. I set the denominator, the square root of x plus five, not equal to zero, and solved that. So I square both sides, and then I subtracted five. So x cannot be negative five. And then I also dealt with the square root. So whatever is inside the square root, x plus five, must be greater than or equal to zero. So x must be greater than or equal to negative five. And I have to combine those two together. So it has to be greater than or equal to negative five, but it can't equal negative five. So therefore, my domain is x is strictly greater than negative five. So again, context trumps everything. But right now, other than that, we only have two domain rules. Rational functions, the denominator cannot equal zero. Square root functions, whatever is inside the square root, must be greater than or equal to zero. Not the whole square root, just whatever is inside of it. And then if you have both of them or a combination, you combine them together. The last thing we're going to talk about is operations on functions. So if you have two functions, f and g, then you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide those functions, and your result will also be a function. So the notation that we use is this inside our function notation, so f plus or minus g of x. That's exactly the same thing as saying f of x plus or minus g of x. Same thing with your product. f times g of x is the same thing as f of x times g of x. And then the quotient, f divided by g of x, is the same thing as f of x divided by g of x. This one you have to be careful because it will create possible new domain issues. The one thing to be aware of with the product is this closed dot represents multiplication. If you see an open circle in between them, that's something else called a composite function, which we will take, talk about later on. So here we have a couple examples. So the first one says f of x equals 2x plus 1 and g of x equals 3x minus 2. And we want to find their sum, difference, product, and quotient, and the domain of each of these. So for f plus g of x, that's the same thing as saying f of x plus g of x. So I'm just going to take 2x plus 1 and add 3x minus 2. And then I'm just going to combine like terms. 2x plus 3x is 5x, plus 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And then this is just a linear function with no context, so its domain is all real numbers. For f minus g of x, that's the same thing as f of x minus g of x. So I'm just going to take 2x plus 1 minus the whole quantity, 3x minus 2. I make sure I distribute the negative through, and I end up with negative x plus 3. Again, just a linear function, so its domain is all real numbers. For c, f times g of x is the same thing as f of x times g of x. So I just took 2x plus 1 times 3x minus 2, and then I fold it out, and I got 6x squared minus x minus 2. And this one's just a quadratic, so again, the domain is just all real numbers. And the last one, f divided by g of x, is f of x divided by g of x, so I end up with 2x plus 1 over 3x minus 2, and there's nothing I can do to simplify that, so that's just my final answer. This one, I now have a rational function, so my domain's going to be a little bit different. I have to set my denominator not equal to 0, just like we were talking about previously, so 3x minus 2 can't be equal to 0, which means 3x can't equal 2, or x cannot equal 2 thirds. So go ahead and pause the video and try f of x equals x minus 1 and g of x equals 2x squared with a through d. So for the first one, f plus g of x, I get x minus 1 plus 2x squared. There's nothing to combine, so you just have 2x squared plus x minus 1, and the domain is all real numbers. For f, of x, f minus g of x, you have x minus 1 minus 2x squared. Again, nothing to combine, so you just have negative 2x squared plus x minus 1, and the domain is all real numbers. For both of those, I wrote them in standard form, highest power to lowest power. For c, f times g of x, I got x minus 1 times 2x squared, so I distributed in the 2x squared into both the x and the negative 1, and got 2x cubed minus 2x squared. Again, domain, all real numbers. And then the last one, f divided by g of x, I got x minus 1 over 2x squared. There's nothing I can do to simplify that, so that's just my final answer. And then the domain for this one, because it's a rational function, 2x squared cannot equal 0, which means x squared cannot equal 0, which means that x cannot equal 0.
So again, operations on functions, you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide two functions, and your result is another function. Um, and you can look at the domains just like we've talked about with previous function domains. Suppose that the revenue, the money that you bring in when you're selling something, R in dollars from selling X clocks is R of X equals 30X, and the cost for the seller, C in dollars of selling X clocks is C of X equals 0.1X squared plus 7X plus 400. And the first thing we wanna do is we wanna find the profit function. So when you're talking about revenue and cost, Profit is the difference between your revenue and your cost. So profit, a profit function, would be your revenue minus your cost. It's how much money you end up making after you take out what you spent. So go ahead and pause the video and write a profit function. So I took the revenue function 30x and I subtracted the cost function 0.1x squared plus 7x plus 400 and I distributed the negative all the way through. So our profit function is negative 0.1x squared plus 23x minus 400. So now use that profit function to find the profit if 30 clocks are sold and find and interpret P of 45. To find the profit if 30 clocks are sold, I just plug 30 into this profit function we found in part A and you end up with $200. And for P of 45, I plugged in 45 into the profit function we found and got 432 so the profit from selling 45 clocks is $432.50. So this has been an intro to functions, function notation, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing functions, as well as domains of functions.